effective, different alternatives to incarceration that are being administered through the criminal justice system. Without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make op opening statements, followed by opening statements of three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And we're also joined by Mr. Davis of Illinois. Thank you for being here, sir. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. The number of individuals incarcerated for drug offenses has increased every year since 1980, despite recent efforts including drug courts and state level initiatives like Proposition 36 in California that are explicitly designed to minimize jail and prison time for non-violent drug related offenders and to provide treatment for drug related offenders. Overall, the correctional population has increased by nearly 2.5 million, or 57% from 1990 to 2005. And the inflation-adjusted expenditures on corrections have more than doubled over the past 20 years. Furthermore, the need for drug treatment among offenders still far outstrips supply. These trends have continued, even as overall illegal drug use, especially abuse of cocaine and heroin, has declined and the drug-related related offender population has aged, which should naturally lead to a decline in the need for incarceration given older offenders decreased propensity for violence. Why and what can be done to reverse these trends? Certainly efforts at sentencing reform and improving how prisoners reenter society well, not the focus of this hearing, are essential to break the cycle of drug abuse and crime and over-reliance on incarceration. Today's hearing has a slightly different focus and is the first congressional hearing to consider in a comparative perspective the various efforts within the criminal justice system itself to avoid incarceration and to provide drug treatment. Drug treatment courts an important part of the picture. I've consistently supported the growth of drug and other problem-solving courts in this subcommittee held a field hearing in Representative Cummings District in Baltimore to witness how these courts are evolving to provide coordinated wraparound services. Despite efforts to bring drug courts to scale, however, they only enroll about 100,000 clients a year out of an estimated 1.5 million yearly arrestees with drug-related issues. While this disparity is partly resulting in limited funding, it is largely the result eligibility restrictions that at times exclude offenders with histories of criminal violence, severe drug addiction problems, and co-concurring disorders. While witnesses today will express optimism that drug courts can be expanded to include some of these offenders, and such expansion is justified by outcome studies and would be cost effective, it's clear that some aspects of their operation will have to change to reflect the different populations they serve. It's also clear that expanding the reach of drug courts is only part of the solution. We'll learn about a new approach demonstrated by Hawaii's HOPE program. HOPE attempts to coerce abstinence through frequent drug testing and the provision of swift and certain sanctions to probationers who continue to test positive. In contrast to drug courts, HOPE initially does not provide drug treatment and reserves a judicially imposed treatment plan for participants who fail to become abstinent in the face of graduated minor sanctions. There's been some initial positive data on HOPE and there is a possibility it can help target drug treatment which is costly to those who truly need it. Nevertheless, there are many important questions that need to be answered and the Hawaii experience needs to be attempted on the mainland before we can judge what role HOPE should play. Finally, we look at the legacy of Proposition 36, which was passed by an initiative uh, of California voters in 2000 and allows first or second time drug possession arrestees with no record of violent offenses to plead guilty to drug possession in return for diversion to a drug treatment program. While it's been criticized for lacking sufficient mechanisms to enforce the requirement that participants complete drug treatment Prop 36 has enrolled over 50,000 participants a year, amassing a wealth of relevant data to the proper design of diversionary programs. The common feature of these programs and approaches that we focus on today is that they are alternatives to incarceration administered within the criminal justice system, 
We should be wary of thinking of one program, approach, or set of approaches, no matter how well conceived, is the answer to over-incarceration. It is possible that programs can uh, cross-hybridize or that different approaches are best understood as complementary and thus should be targeted to different drug-involved offending populations. Congress must ensure that the Department of Justice and the Office of National Drug Control Policy, as policy experts, researchers, and grant makers, constantly measure the effectiveness of these programs, collect evidence about best practices, and consistent with our notions of a just and safe society, help states make informed judgments. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. To create continuing disincentives for drug-involved offenders, incarceration has been a, a primary and an effective solution. Today, one out of 100 Americans has spent time behind bars, sometimes disproportionately repeat offenders. The solutions to preventing incarceration are critical. Treatment and the type of local community-based care given to those with substance abuse and mental health disorders are necessary to fostering permanent positive behavior changes. Treatment, along with training and skill development and stopping the flow of drug uh, across the border are the only ways to ensure we no longer have drug abusers. We must bear in mind that solutions which work for one person do not always work for another. Today I look forward to learning about the various tried and true solutions from our witnesses. It is, uh, my opinion, I just want to emphasize this, that legalizing drugs is certainly not the solution to preventing incarceration, is not the solution to dealing with our drug problems. The harm to communities and families as a result of drug use has nothing to do with our current laws. We must work to prevent, control, and mitigate addiction as we continue to fight this overall destructive behavior. With that, I would yield back and look forward to our witnesses. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes uh, Ms. Watson of California. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for holding this exceedingly important hearing on the front end alternatives to incarceration for drug-involved offenders and abusers of illegal drugs. This hearing occurs at an opportune moment. Each year, our prison population grows, creating a heavy human cost for our communities and an increasingly a large burden on the already strained budgets of our states. Uh, in California at this time, we have a proposition on the ballot that attempts to legalize marijuana, which I am uh, uh, very opposed to, but uh, they're looking for a way to receive more revenues and they think they can do it this way. There's nothing to resolve the problem of uh, the addictive use. So as we analyze the nation's approach to reducing the availability and abuse of drugs, it's important to emphasize both the individual and group cost of addiction. Domestically, the disease of addiction has devastating consequences for individuals, families, communities, and our judicial and healthcare systems while on an international scale, as stated by Secretary of State Clinton while in Mexico, our insatiable demand for illegal drugs fuels the drug trade. It is imperative that we define and demolish the barriers to treatment for the millions of Americans struggling to regain themselves from the depths of addiction by providing treatment and incentives to get clean, we can begin to reduce the rates of incarceration and recidivism for those who are abusing or addicted to drugs. In 2000, voters from my state of California recognized the need for alternatives to incarceration by some nonviolent drug offenders and passed Proposition 36 by popular referendum. While there are clear limitations to this program, I'm eager to hear from today's witnesses about Proposition 36 and other non-conventional methods of reducing incarceration levels while uh, making our community stronger and safer. Uh, I would like to thank all the witnesses today for their testimony and you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership and your dedication to this issue, and I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the uh, gentlelady, and the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Davis of Illinois. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me first of all thank you for giving me the opportunity to sit in on this hearing. Although I am not a member of this subcommittee, one of the big tasks that I had to make in the last reorganization was to not be on this committee. <laughs> and, and, and I'm always delighted to get a chance to come by. I also, though, want to commend I, you. I would like to, I would like to say, uh, if I may, as Chairman, that uh, I ask unanimous consent to permit Mr. Davis, who is not a member of this subcommittee, to participate in this subcommittee. Without objection, you may proceed. Thank you very much again, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you for tackling the big issues, the heavy ones, the tough ones. I mean, you have a long history of doing that, and so I wouldn't expect you to do anything else. I want to thank all of the witnesses for coming because given the fact that our country, this country, has the largest number of individuals incarcerated of any nation on the face of the earth in proportion to population as well as in actual numbers. And so trying to find alternatives to incarceration, I think, is just one of the major things that we ought to be doing. I appreciate all of the witnesses who are here, especially one, Melody Heaps, with whom I've worked for any number of years and consider to be one of the foremost authorities on alternatives to incarceration in the nation in relationship to how you handle the drug treatment problem, the issues related to drugs, and especially individuals who are also incarcerated, have been incarcerated, might become incarcerated, and also make use of all drugs as a part of their lifestyle. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank all of the witnesses, and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. If uh, there are no opening, uh, other opening statements, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I want to introduce our first panel. Mr. James H. Birch II is Acting Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Office of Justice Programs, U.S. Department of Justice, where he served for nearly 15 years. Prior to his appointment as Acting Director, Mr. Birch served as the Deputy Director for Policy at BJA, overseeing an office and efforts designed to provide leadership in criminal justice policy, training, and technical assistance, and to further the administration of justice. Mr. Birch began his career in public service at the local level, working for several years on case and records management and automation for the circuit court in Prince George's County, Maryland, and as a civilian within a local law enforcement agency. We also have uh, with us Mr. Benjamin B. Tucker. Mr. Tucker is the newly confirmed Deputy Director for State, Local, and Tribal Affairs for the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Beginning his career as a beat cop in New York City's Policy Department, Mr. Tucker has 40 years of experience in the fields of law enforcement and criminal justice. He is a recognized expert in community policing. An attorney prior to joining the ONDCP, Mr. Tucker served as a professor of criminal justice at Pace University, director of field operations, and senior research associate at the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University, uh, in the Department of Justice, and in various positions in the New York City government. Director Birch and Deputy Director Tucker, this uh, subcommittee is very grateful for your appearance today and also grateful to your service to the people and to this country. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, gentlemen, to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you uh, stand and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let the record reflect that both of the witnesses 
have answered in the affirmative. I have to say that in the 14 years I've been in Congress, I don't think I've ever had anyone say I don't. I would ask that each, each witness give an oral summary of uh, your testimony. Keep this summary about five minutes. Your complete written statement will be in the hearing record. So, Mr. Birch, uh, you are the first witness on this panel. Thank you for being here. I ask that you proceed. Thank you. Chairman Cass